thank you for joining me today. Uh, thanks for having me. Of course. And congratulations on the release of Dreams of Land Unseen. Uh, thank you. We waited <laughs> for quite a long time for it. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel now that it's finally out in the world? Oh, I'm on the one hand, I'm really very excited that we can finally release it and people are listening to the songs, people are, like the album, but usually when your record is out, it's already out, you know, so mm -hmm. it's like some kind of a milestone and there is no expectation you know from people and some people already started asking us about the next record although <laughs> you know it just dropped so yeah right it has its ups and downs but it's better to have a new album out than not <laughs> for sure and it's, it's definitely clear from the response that it has gotten so far that it is um really resonating with fans and they're curious to learn more about um Sophia's life and adventures so how does it feel to know that your music has inspired that thirst for knowledge? Yeah, I'm actually very pleased that people enjoy the story behind the album, like not only the songs, but they are curious about Sofia Jablonska, who is the subject of the album. And also it was one of our goals, you know, to have people um, learn about her and spread a little bit of Ukrainian legacy and heritage, you know. So it's really cool because they keep asking us questions. They, we try, you know, we created some kind of a track by track series where we break down the stories behind the songs. And yeah, it's like, it's always something to tell about each of the songs. And this is something what I really want to be a part of our music because this is the second no it's actually the third release that we're doing as a concept album and i feel that this is like some kind of our thing you know and could you tell us more about how you came up with the idea to base the album on her story and uh maybe what drew you to her life and experiences in particular yeah so um it was 2021 and we were sitting at home because of the pandemic and mm -hmm. I am personally a huge fan of traveling so it was unbearable for me and uh, in our band um, the keyboardist is the main composer so he already had a few demos and he showed them to me and because they had different folk vibes you could clearly hear that it's about different countries and maybe about traveling. So at some point I thought maybe we could dedicate each song to a different traveler from different time frames. Mm -hmm. And I started digging on this topic and I found out about Sophia. I was so mind blown about like her personality, about her stories. I started reading her travelogues and I was like, okay, we should make the entire record about her because to be honest, like I've read everything that I could find and we could write several more albums based on just her adventures because sometimes you could read on one page about five different events that happened to her, you know? So mm -hmm. it's um, very inspirational to me and I also find a lot of similarities between herself and, and myself, uh, although we have like 100 of years of difference. So... Yeah, it was an amazing person to find out about. For sure. And it's it's amazing to listen to. So clearly you guys knew what you were doing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. And as you've kind of gotten into a little bit already, um, the album is uh, like one complete story that unfolds over the course of 10 tracks. Um, could you tell us more about your creative process and um, developing that narrative as well as organizing the songs into a specific order? Mm hmm. Uh, so like I said, we already had, I think, four or five demos. And when we already understood what the concept would be, I tried, you know, listening to the songs and maybe adjusting some stories of Yablonska to this song. So if we had some Chinese vibes, I clearly thought that this should be a song about one of her stories on her trip to China, let's say. And I was literally uh, reading the travelogues and I was noting down I had a special notebook to put down all the phrases all the stories that I really liked and then I tried you know mix and matching them to the demos but of course um, there were 
there was half an album more to write. So that's why I was really telling the stories to Yevgeny, our main composer. And I said, okay, we should maybe, for example, the song Incurable Disease is about like the passion of Sophia and also my passion to the sea in general. So we shaped like this song around this concept as well. And because Sophia spent over 10 years in China and we already had um, the golden shell as the Chinese vibe song, but I said, okay, we need something more Chinese because like her experience with China was so long and diverse that actually now you also have Camera Obscura, which is about the superstitions of Chinese people uh, to take in pictures because um, they thought that it was like a taboo because they um, thought that when a person takes a picture of another person, then uh, this person doesn't have the soul anymore because each person is a reflection of a god. So yeah, Camera Obscura is about China as well. Opium Mist is based entirely on Sophia's experience of smoking opium with an old Chinese guy. So yeah, it was like just following her stories and also maybe her attitude to traveling, her lifestyle and just... Mm, for example, the song To No and I O is also about vagabonds in general, you know. So when Sophia was traveling, she really adapted well with the locals and they mostly asked her that maybe she could stay with them. But she always packed her, her stuff and moved on. And this is what this song is also about. So it was pure pleasure, you know, to just, uh, I don't know, complete these songs based on the stories. That's incredible. And I think this album is probably the most um, diverse to date for your band. And um, there's a huge range of musical styles and influences. Um, so how did you go about incorporating all of these different elements into the album? And what were some key influences that inspired that sound and the direction of the album? I think that we've always had a blessing and a curse of combining a lot of genres in our music. And um, sometimes we get misunderstood by that because people keep asking us what genre are you playing <laughs> in? And it's like very hard to explain. And especially when people try to judge us by one song only, so they don't really get the entire picture. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that again, with our music, we are making some kind of a soundtrack of the stories that we're doing. And just like it is in the movies, sometimes you've got more intense stuff going on. And this is where musically in metal, you could do the blast beats and heavier riffs. Then you have maybe some calm parts and and here you can do the clean vocals, maybe some harmony. So we're trying to do it this way, just to create the atmosphere for each track. And if you take Opium Mist, for example, which is like nearly eight minutes long, we even have like some kind of a very atmospheric intro that is not music at all. These are just sounds of the Chinese market to create like this impression that you're standing like in the middle of the Chinese market. So... Yeah, we're just, um, we, in terms of influence, is the main difference of us from many other bands is that we don't listen to metal only, and we're open-minded to tons of genres from pop, techno, to world music, to soundtracks, and that's why we're not afraid of incorporating them to our music. And yeah, if that means that we get misunderstood by some reviewers, for example, then be it, you know, I think that like these days from what we've seen, uh, the progressive metal uh, listeners dig our music the most because again, they're not afraid, you know, to listen to a lot of stuff mixed. Uh, and you mentioned incorporating the sounds of that Chinese market into the song. Um, the album features a ton of um, immersive sounds and the production it leads to that immersion as well. So there's a ton of um, subtle sound effects and details that add to the atmosphere. Uh, could you speak to the role that the production and sound design played in bringing the concept album to life and uh, how you work to create such a, a rich and detailed landscape? 
Yeah, so we, again, are not afraid to use, um, you know, music libraries publicly available. We're not afraid to use uh, VST plugins in our sound design. So we, of course, have some, for example, folk traditional instruments recorded live. And especially being in Ukraine in the middle of the war, we couldn't really find and people to play those instruments. So we basically went online and tried to find freelance musicians from different countries that could play these instruments. And I think that having the internet, um, it's like one of the best things to do. Um, so we're not afraid, you know, to give this part to someone else to play. Uh, and in terms of creating the atmosphere, again, uh, like if we felt that the song needs something on top of just uh, ordinary usual instruments for metal band. We just tried to give this more extra sounds. So you have in the golden shell, you also have the sound of the waves, for example, because this was the continuation of the story. And um, it just fit. I don't know. It's like the same thing is that when we write songs, we know which language we want to choose, either English or Ukrainian. With the sounds, it's as well. It's just a part of our composing, I would say. And this is something that I also like uh, in other bands, when other bands do this. If they have like this atmosphere happening, this is what I really like. Uh, and can you speak to any challenges that you guys faced while uh, creating the album? Yeah, well, uh, uh, in terms of composing the album, it was 100% complete before the war um, started here in Ukraine. So, And this is how we usually work. So when we step into the studio, we're like absolutely prepared because our sound producer is very demanding. So it's <laughs> like he keeps us in discipline. Uh, so yeah, we recorded half of the album before February 24th, then of course the war kicked in and for several months we couldn't really even listen to other music because we were basically afraid of every sound out there. Then um, when our region was deoccupied, um, well, we understood that we just have to continue with this album because this is part of what we do and just by moving on, we also help our country to fight in this war because we continue, we create some kind of legacy. We are making an album about a famous Ukrainian person. So it also relates, you know, to spreading the culture. And um, the entire Ukraine has been, you know, helping with donations to the army, to the volunteers. And of course, we cannot donate if we don't get an income. And this is our income. So yeah, we continued with the album recordings, although it was very hard because we had to drive through multiple checkpoints in Kiev and it, it took a very long time. We had a very early military curfew, so we had to be back home at 7 p.m. or whatnot. And we recorded the takes in between air raid sirens and, um, you know, shelling. And then we still had to postpone the album because we couldn't take band photos. We couldn't uh, film music videos because usually those are made in the studios that are located in industrial districts. And those are the main target for all the missiles. So we had to postpone the album uh, for half a year, I think. And in the end, we also recorded three music videos in two months in the middle of the longest power outages, in the middle of the biggest missile attacks. And uh, sometimes we didn't have uh, internet or cell phone connection for several days, so we couldn't even reach our production teams. So it was insane, to be honest, but I'm so glad that we did it and everything was done in time and no one suffered, uh, no one was injured during the filming which is also, you know, you never know <laughs> how it goes. We had to use generators all the time because you could be filming and then the power goes off. You never know when it comes back. And that's why we also created, like we tried to capture all these backstage moments with uh, behind the scenes blogs. Uh, you could see, I think one of them so far on the Naples Records channel, we have some of them on our Patreon. So yeah, we did our best 
And I'm really glad that we did it all and the album is out there, the videos are out there. But yeah, there are a lot of challenges at this point. The biggest challenge is that it's very hard for us to tour because the men are not allowed uh, to go out of the country. They can be mobilized. And uh, last year it was easier because we toured as cultural ambassadors, but some bands didn't uh, return back to Ukraine, so they broke the rules. Now the regulations are more tough, so we're, we're just trying to find a way because we have some festivals announced and we really want to be back on stage. For sure. And uh, more on those issues in the Ukraine, uh, could you speak to the importance of honoring your country and language by including tracks in Ukrainian on the album? Yeah, I would say that we never do it for the sake of just doing it you know so if we feel that it really fits uh, because sometimes the songs are being born just in the language that that it's being born in and uh here it made a perfect sense because Sofia Yablonska is from Ukraine and wherever she traveled she always emphasized that I'm from Ukraine and she tried to bring some small part of Ukrainian culture wherever she traveled although she was open-minded to other cultures as well. And, well, we're also from Ukraine, so we wanted, you know, to showcase our roots. Um, but again, uh, some people also say maybe we could make an entire record in Ukrainian language, but I think that it will still scare off a lot of people. And even with this uh, concept album, some reviewers said that you know, they started listening to the album. Now they have the Ukrainian song and it, it falls apart for them a little bit because they don't understand uh, what we're singing about. Uh, well, I really hope that people are still open-minded and they check out the lyrics online and maybe translate them with Google Translator because again, um, no one tells Rammstein to sing in, you know, English language. <laughs> so I think that... Um, yeah, but in general, the, the response was great and people really like uh, when we incorporate Ukrainian songs, songs in Ukrainian. And how do you think that Sofia would react to your album if she were able to hear it today? Oh, I actually, I was wondering about it, <laughs> you know, several <laughs> times, uh, but I think that... Um, Again, she she was a very progressive woman, so I hope that um, she would be glad about it again because we're spreading a word about her and this is what she also did in her time, like spreading the word about Ukrainian culture. And uh, yeah, I just hope that she, she would love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much again for speaking with me today. Um, just to wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say to your fans or any information on how they could support you and the people of the Ukraine during these difficult times? Yeah, thank you so much for the interest in our band and in our album. I hope that you check out Dreams of Lands and Scene from the start to finish because it's some kind of a journey that we were building for this album. And uh, again, please don't judge us by one song only. Uh, if you have a chance, please pre please order the copy of the album on CD or vinyl uh, because we're signed with Napalm Records right now. It's very accessible all over the world. Um, and yeah, if you want to give us an extra support, please join our Patreon. We've been running it for nearly five years now. So there is a lot of content and there is a great community of people from all over the world. And of course, uh, please follow the news on the situation in Ukraine. The war is not over yet. And if you can donate to the trusted funds supporting us uh, in fighting back our lands, then please do. And thank you.